ancient Egypt, the land of the Nile and of kings who were revered as living gods. But their power wasn't absolute. Behind closed doors, they had many rivals. My name is Sarah, and this is the story of a political crisis. This is how the old kingdom of Egypt came to be. Follow me, and I'll bring you in the mists of time. The year is 1900. A group of archaeologists is exploring the Egyptian site known as Amel Kab. The first digs in this area had revealed the tombs of the early kings of Egypt. Whoever was involved in the project had to be very aware of the importance of this archaeological expedition. Understanding what lay under the sands of Amel Kab meant to finally find some answers about the early days of the pharaohs. The archaeologists made an amazing discovery. They found a tomb that was the burial of someone of great power and prestige. They thought it was the resting place of an unknown early king, and so they further explored the tomb. They found an underground chamber that was surmounted by a large structure. Here, there were eight storerooms filled with pottery, which were intended to be used by the pharaoh in the afterlife. Around the building, they made a grim discovery. There were 41 minor tombs, which contained clear remains of human sacrifices. When the leader died, his servants were killed, so they could continue to serve him in the afterlife. Eventually, a name was found written in the tomb, Mernif, which means beloved of Nip, who was one of the mighty goddesses of the north. The archaeologists had just discovered the tomb of the first queen of Egypt. Her husband was King Jet. He died around the year 2980 BC leaving behind his wife Mernif and her little son, Dan. The king's early departure marked the beginning of a political crisis. In fact, the heir to the throne was too young to rule, and it was forbidden for a woman to become a pharaoh, even if she had royal blood. So Mernif had to face the dangerous political landscape of her time, to protect both her son and the idea of a united Egypt. Before the young Dan, only four kings had sat on the throne. The kingdom of Egypt was young and frail. At any moment, it could fracture in hundreds of small city-states. When King Narmer had unified Egypt, many lords had to think something along these lines. Okay, we have been conquered by this guy. We will pay taxes to him and recognize his authority but eventually his dynasty will fade away and we will regain our independence. Many of them had to be quite happy when the political crisis flared up. Maybe the young Dan was going to be Egypt's last pharaoh. Mernif managed to be recognized as queen regent. By doing this, she was able to keep the country united and stable while her son could grow and learn how to properly rule. Mernif's guide was essential for Egypt's survival. Surely some lords were looking at the political crisis as the opportunity to regain their own independence. But Mernif showed to be a clever politician, and her high-status tomb tells us that she gained a lot of prestige and respect. We're used to thinking about the country of the pyramids as an immutable and eternal kingdom. But at Mernit's time, it was a very weak political construct. It is quite probable that without this bright woman, Egypt's history wouldn't have been the same. When King Den became an adult, 
he was finally able to rule by himself. But he had to face many challenges. Let's take a look at his royal titles. One of them was Kasti, which means he of the two deserts. The valley of the Nile is in fact delimited on both sides by two desertic regions. With his title, Dan wanted to say that his kingdom was everything between the sands. Think about it. A king that needs to publicly state which are the extensions of his kingdom's borders is a weak one. Dan's legitimacy was being questioned by many, not openly, of course, but we can easily imagine what was happening behind closed doors. Many lords were tired of paying taxes to a central authority that didn't exist when their grandfathers were alive. Treason was in the air. I believe that Dan's goal was to say something like this. There's no such thing as a northern and a southern part of the country. So cut short any discussions about the independence of your city-states. The Kingdom of Egypt is here to stay. Anyway, Dan proved to be a brave warrior king. He led long-range raids to very distant lands. Libya in the west and Nubia in the south. These raids were very useful to the king on a political level. The loot could be distributed to the best warriors, creating a core of loyal supporters. This is something that is quite convenient when you are surrounded by political enemies. Dan was not only a warlord. He clearly understood the importance of commercial networks. In fact, he invested many resources in order to reach faraway markets. He also started to develop mines in the Sinai Peninsula, a region that was extremely wild at the time. Sadly, this is all we know about Dan's reign. He was one of the last pharaohs of the first dynasty of Egypt. Other kings succeeded him, but they were weaker and they were not able to fully control the country. Slowly, the kingdom descended into chaos, and eventually, Naamor's lineage faded away in the mists of time. When the dust settled, one of the greatest kings of Egypt sat on the throne. His name was Zoser, and he went down in history for being the first of the pyramid builders. The very symbol of ancient Egypt had entered the stage. The golden age of the pharaohs had begun. The power of the kings remained quite limited. But now that the clash for the throne had ended, the rulers could invest incredible resources in their own projects. Zoser engaged in a competition with his own ancestors. He wanted to prove to be the greatest king of all time. So he built a huge tomb for himself. His successors will try to surpass him too, and eventually a sort of race will begin. If you were a competent king, you had to show it by building the greatest pyramid of all time. One after the other, each pyramid was bigger than the one that was built before, until Khufu built the greatest of all. For more than 3,800 years, it was the largest building in the world. This record was broken only in 1300 of the Common Era, when the Lincoln Cathedral was built. When the age of the pyramids began, the deep political crisis seemed to be finally over. A new dynasty of explorer kings sat on the throne, and Sahuri was one of the greatest. He sent merchants and sailors in every direction to discover what lay beyond the seas and deserts. Try to imagine for a moment to be a sailor of that time. Think about what kind of courage it took to get on a Bronze Age ship and to start exploring the unknown. Many sailors were lost forever at sea. But those who had come back could tell incredible stories about the wealth of distant countries. 
So you said farewell to your family and you dare to go. After your departure, no news about you reached dry land. But finally, one day, the masts of your ship were visible against the flat line of the sea. Immediately, your fellow sailors began unloading the cargo. Pottery full of exotic food, timber, and many unlucky slaves. Then, someone pushed the cage. Here there was a fearful beast, a big brown Syrian bear. Imagine the surprise of the patron who had invested his money on this expedition. To him, the bear had to appear like a magical animal from another world. I'm not making it up. King Sahuri recorded this very scene on his tomb, a fact that was not trivial at all. These sea expeditions were the greatest achievement of his entire life. Under Sahuri's rule, Egyptian adventurers pushed themselves as far as modern-day Somalia. This country was called the Land of Punt, and it was also known as the Land of the Gods, for such was its wealth. Here the merchants from the Nile bought incense, gold, exotic animals, ivory and ebony. So, everything looks fine, right? Huge pyramids were built and the kingdom was becoming richer. What can go wrong? Actually, many things. Under a facade of stability, the embers of the political crisis were still burning. King Sahuri may have been a great explorer, but under his dynasty the centralized control by the pharaohs started to crumble down and a large number of feudal powers began to emerge on the horizon. The evidence of this power shift is provided by this tomb. Indeed, he was someone who really mattered, but he wasn't from the royal family. T was just a public servant. Despite this, he was able to marry a royal princess by accumulating power and wealth. This really shows us a great weakening of the central authority. A marriage of this kind was something that was unthinkable for a private citizen under the previous dynasties. So, central power was really vanishing. The last king of the dynasty was Unas, who died without a male heir. The throne was grabbed like a whirlwind by a very powerful nobleman known as Teti. To legitimize this coup, he married Una's daughter. Teti chose the title of Setuptawi, which means he who pacifies the two lands. From Teti's royal name, we understand that the passage of dynasties wasn't a peaceful one. Despite the violent power grabbing, the new pharaoh was able to quickly restore the king's peace. To achieve this goal, Teti formed a vast network of alliances with the great feudal lords. However, not all factions were happy with his policies, and eventually he was murdered. A man named Usurkari took the throne. This person is quite mysterious. We don't know if he led the coup against Teti, or if he had simply filled the void left by the assassination of the king. We're not completely sure about this, but it seems that Usurkari was Yuna's nephew. The man did not accept that Teti had stolen the throne from his family. But Usurkari controlled only some areas around the delta of the Nile. The rest of the country was in Pepi's hands. He was Teti's son, and he was able to defeat Usurkari thanks to the support of his father's royalists. By doing this, he finally reunited the country and he raised the usurper's name from history. Despite his astonishing victory, Pepi's grip on the throne was not very solid. Very soon, he became surrounded by enemies, some of them from his own family. One of his wives even attempted to murder him in order to put her son on the throne. This event led Pepi to seek an alliance with the most powerful man of the kingdom. His name was Kui, and his official status was not high, but he was in control of the caravan routes that came from the depths of Africa. 
This made Q an incredible wealthy man. To secure Q's support, the king married his two daughters. By doing this, the king was able to widen his power base and to stabilize his control over the country. But this stability came at a cost, for he finally opened the halls of power to those who were not members of the royal family. Narmer had created a united Egypt. Sahori opened it up to the world. And now the control by the pharaohs was crumbling down in favor of feudal lords, ambitious merchants, and scheming bureaucrats. The old kingdom of Egypt was not bound to last. 